let's go over domain 2.4 indicators of malicious activity. So in this section, we're going to go over a lot of different things and it's pretty robust section. So we're going to go over the different types of malware attacks, different types of physical attacks, network based attacks, application attacks, cryptographic attacks, password attacks, then also how we can discover these types of attacks and the indicators of compromise. So let's go ahead and get started. So first we have to understand what a malware threat is. So malware is malicious software designed to damage, disrupt, or gain unauthorized access to computer systems. So as just an umbrella term, malware is just there to damage or disrupt your networks and your enterprise. And then from there, we have a multiple different types of malware and how they get exploited, how they attack your network, and what types of payload they are, and how they get transmitted onto your enterprise. So it's important that we understand the various types because we will identify, prevent, and mitigate them with different techniques. Ransomware. So this is malware that encrypts users' data and demands payment for the decryption key. So a lot of times you've seen this maybe like, uh, my computers had ransomware before when I was a lot younger, where a pop-up comes up and says, you must pay this with either uh, cryptocurrency or with your debit card, and then we'll release your files. Oftentimes they're not gonna do that. And ransomware is a virus or malware that's gonna encrypt your data or your system and demand payment for it. So this is often spread through phishing emails or exploiting vulnerabilities. And the way we can prevent or mitigate this. So having a backup of a known good system. So let's say we take a backup of our system on Monday. Tuesday, we get infected with ransomware because our one of our users clicked on a phishing email. Wednesday, we come into work and realize we have ransomware. The easiest thing to do, the first thing we should do is just revert back to that backup. Other ways to mitigate and prevent is to train staff on what phishing is and to make sure that they're educated enough to know not to click on suspicious looking emails. Trojans. So this is going to be malware described as legitimate software. Some key characteristics, they're mainly there to create backdoors, steal data, and to harm host systems. So they can come in in a bunch of different ways as well. They can come in as... Uh, a phishing email, they can be a part of different malware or viruses, just kind of like almost like an add-on, right? So what we want to do to prevent this, make sure that we have antivirus, anti-malware suites that are doing signature-based and heuristic-based threat detection. And we can avoid downloading software from untrusted sources. So have you ever been to a website, you, hear, you get a pop-up that's like, download this now to speed up your system. And then you click it and you download it. And it said, oh, this will help me. This software will help me. That's a Trojan, right? Worms. So these are going to be self-replicating malware. So this is malware that replicates itself to spread to other computers. So the key thing we have to know about a worm is that it can spread without user interaction. This is often exploiting network vulnerabilities. So a worm may infect your system because you have, let's say, like the simple message block protocol open. That's port... 445, 139, right? File sharing protocols that are highly vulnerable. And they can come in through that port and then they can self-propagate throughout your network and your systems. How to prevent this? So some basic things, keep your systems updated, make sure you're applying proper patches, harden your devices, use good network segmentation, okay? Maybe that includes host-based firewalls or host-based prevention. Obviously, having network segmentation, having east to west filtering, using firewalls to can prevent maybe some of these worms that are using those exploitable ports and protocols. Spyware. So this is malware that secretly gathers information without the user's knowledge. So spyware can sometimes be very malicious in nature. Sometimes it, it is actually... Not malicious in the fact that you may have authorized it. Sometimes software downloads that are not malicious can have spyware built into them. So this is how you're going to, spyware is going to monitor user activity. It can do things like collect keystrokes and then send them back, maybe like through an IRC chat, back to like a command and control center to try to steal your password, do credential harvesting. It can also harvest data. 
ways to prevent this. In your AV and anti-malware suites that you're going to deploy on your endpoints, you can also make sure it includes anti-spyware tools. Of course, software updates, hardening your OSs, and be cautious about the permissions granted to applications. Sometimes you grant permission to applications to use spyware technology or to do spyware uh, features and functionality. Bloatware, sometimes called uh, potentially unwanted programs. This is going to be unnecessary software that consumes system resources. With Windows, big issue, right? When you go buy like a Windows Home Edition, it's going to have like Xbox and a bunch of different things that you may not want, right? We can consider that bloatware. Often this is pre-installed on devices and can degrade performance and security. Not to totally attack Android users, but Samsung. I don't know if they still do this, but they had all their Samsung applications that I don't think anybody uses. That's bloatware, okay? Not attacking Samsung, great phones, but that could be considered bloatware to a user. Now, when you're talking about the enterprise, we want to make sure that we just have applications that we want, and that's it. Kind of this gets into our allow list, right? Making sure we have restricted activities and restricted software. Making sure we don't fall victim to bloatware, okay? So like if we're just shopping on Amazon, but we don't use Kindle and we don't use music, it's not malicious software, not malicious at all, but it's not needed. It could take up storage. It can take up some of our memory. If it's running stuff in the background, it could be, uh, we could be giving permissions granted to this these uh, bloatware software that we're not aware of doing spyware, right? So it's important that we regularly review and uninstall unnecessary applications. A lot of times this just goes hand in hand with good hardening techniques, right? Getting rid of or turning off unnecessary port services and applications. Okay, viruses. So this is malware that attaches itself to clean files and spreads to other, other files. So viruses are file-based, okay? They can corrupt files, consume resources, and spread throughout networks as well. It does require interaction, so a little different than worms and how they self-propagate. So again, how do we prevent viruses? Antivirus software, guys. Make sure you're doing that signature-based detection, especially with well-known viruses. Don't open up suspicious attachments. If you fall victim to a phishing email, or let's say you get a phishing email and it has an attachment that says, download this PDF, don't just download it because that may be an executable file that downloads a virus. Key loggers. So this is going to be malware that records keystrokes made by a user. This is specific, okay? So sometimes even keyboards can have this installed on it at the hardware level, right? If you're buying stuff from Alibaba and you don't know where it's coming from. So key loggers are malware that record keystrokes made by a user. They steal sensitive information like passwords, credit cards, kind of uh, building that characteristic. So really advanced key loggers uh, software, what they'll do is they'll have like, kind of like how DLP systems have these data classifications where it's like, hey, we're looking for numbers that look like this, right? Four digits. We're looking for that. So if you see that being typed in and it matches this pattern, Send it back to our command and control center, okay? So prevention. Obviously, again, when we install those antivirus, anti-malware suites, install anti-key logging. Sometimes this is like a byproduct of viruses. So sometimes just having AV, a anti-malware is going to help that. You can use, I mean, this is kind of a crazy one, using virtual keyboards, maybe just for sensitive data entry, a little extra, right? But that would be good defense in depth. Use the keyboard, you're typing up a research paper, but when you're doing your credit card information. That's why sometimes they even say like the autofill can sometimes be secure, right? Because if you use autofill, no key logging get to it. But then again, if your account gets exposed, then autofill sucks because now the attacker that stole your user account has all that information, right? Logic bomb. So this is going to be a malware. Now this is kind of... This is malware that's triggered by a specific event or time. However, this malware could be a worm. It could be a virus. It could be any of those other categories. What well, makes it a specific uh, to a logic bomb, to categorize it as a logic bomb, is that it has if 
then logic, right? If this happens, if the user opens up a web browser at 9.05 a.m., then do data exfiltration over a TCP port so that maybe if they're doing scans, it looks like regular web traffic. That's what a logic bomb is. It'll lie dormant until triggered by some sort of logic, okay? And that logic is going to be like an if-then statement, like if you're a programmer, right? If this happens, then execute this. So how do we can prevent this? Doing audits, monitoring code, making sure you're doing those network scans, and again, doing that behavior analysis, and making sure that if something's deviating from that behavior, that we get alerted. Implement robust authentication and access controls, right? Making sure that we have good authentication and access controls so that these logic bombs can't be installed. Rootkits. So this is malware that grants administrative level control over a computer system. It can hide its existence and other malware. It's gonna be very difficult to detect and remove. So rootkits can sometimes get installed on like firmware, right guys? And like we talked about previously in our other sections, a lot of our antivirus, anti-malware, sometimes it's only scanning and detecting at the OS level, not actually looking at the hardware, right? Not getting deep into the firmware, okay? Physical security. So we want to recognize physical security breaches as well. So this is going to be attempts to damage, disrupt, or gain unauthorized physical access to systems and facilities. So the importance of physical security. We want to make sure that we have our defense in depth approach in the physical realm as well, making sure we have fences, biometric scanners, our CCTV systems, okay? We want to protect, and our physical security protects against theft, damage, and unauthorized access to our critical systems. Brute force attacks. So a brute force attacks is going to be a type of password attack that targets weak passwords by just going down a long list of common passwords that could be associated to that user account, okay? How do we prevent this? We want to implement strong password policies. We want to make sure we have good account lockout policies. So let's say we find a user, we know that user 01, we're trying to exploit the password. And so we're trying different of basic password variations, right? So password, zero rd password at sign ssw zero rd bang after those three attempts we should lock the account out okay we want to also make sure that if let's say a password does get brute force because sometimes even if we have good password policies the users will still make it super easy right for attackers to do these brute force attacks multi-factor authentication always 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 for everything you have if you don't want it to be susceptible to these password attacks, these credential harvesting attacks, do multi-factor authentication. RFD cloning. Let's call this the silent copycat. So what, we, what we're talking about here is when we have our physical access control systems and we have badges, we have proximity readers where they have to badge in to get access to unauthorized, to, to get access to secure areas. What we could do if someone steals that badge is we can do an RFID clone and then use that same RFID, RFID signature to gain access, unauthorized access to that secure area. We can also do this with payment cards as well. So we could do this with credit cards and debit cards. Environmental threats. So we wanna make sure that we don't have any physical environmental factors that can disrupt or damage our systems. So what we're talking about here is just making sure that we have good uh, environmental controls in place, especially when we're dealing with hardware, right, guys? If we have a comms closet, we want to make sure that, one, it was designed to handle servers and computing and server equipment. And if it wasn't, what are we doing to make sure that we're controlling humidity, that we're controlling the temperature in there, that we're not overheating our systems? So obviously, when we're dealing with on-prem data centers, we're going to work with a team to design robust physical infrastructure, have enough energy and power and backups. We want to make sure we have good environmental monitoring. Even in like big server chassis, we can monitor the temperature, right? There's SNMP, there's uh, management information base 
OI, OIDs available to actually monitor the temperatures of our systems. Okay, now let's do our check on learning. Let's do this domain quiz. Question one, which type of malware is known for holding data hostage until a ransom is paid? That's going to be ransomware. Question two, what is RFID cloning primarily used for in the context of security attacks? That's going to be creating a copy of an RFID tag to gain unauthorized access to secure premises. Question three, what type of attack involves an unauthorized person gaining physical access to a device and attempting multiple password combinations to unlock it? So it's not going to be anything with RFID or environmental guys. That's going to be a brute force attack. Question four, which of the following malware is specifically designed to replicate itself and spread to other computers without user intervention? That's going to be C, a worm. Question five, which type of malware secretly monitors and logs keystrokes, potentially capturing sensitive data like usernames and passwords? So that's going to be a keylogger, okay? That's going to capture keystrokes. Question six, a system administrator discovers a code in the network that is designed to trigger a malicious function when a specific event occurs, such as a date and time or the launch of a program. Which type of malware best describes this scenario? That's going to be a logic bomb, right, guys? A logic bomb has that if-then logic. If this happens, then execute this malware. 